Hello Willow family, it's good to be with you. And I am super excited about this series, Courage Calling. I don't know too many people that when they step out towards God's call on their life, don't at some point need more courage to follow Jesus. Now, uh, I was super excited when Paul Jr. invited me to his house to play. Uh, he was uh, two years older than me. I think I was seven and he was nine years old. And so he was just automatically cooler than all the friends that I had. And when Paul Jr. invited me to his house, I was super excited. We got there and guys, it did not disappoint. This was the biggest house I had ever Seen. And come to find out, the reason it was so big is because it was connected, not just a big house, but it was connected to their, his father's business, Paul Sr.'s business. And so it was just this huge house. We got to uh, playing hide and go seek, and Paul Jr. let me know, hey, there's one really important thing you need to remember as we play this game, and that is that you can't go down the hall to the right, through the door, down the steps, over the, the hallway, across the little thing, into that section of the home, because that's where my dad's business is that's attached to the home. And so I thought, yeah, yeah, you know, no, no problem, no problem, no problem. And, and, and then it was time for you know, him to hide his eyes, and I'm like, going to go hide. And so I'm trying to remember what he said. Go down the hall to the left, to the right, to the where, to the what. And next thing you know, I end up in Paul Sr.'s workplace, but I didn't know it. I'd just gone through a door and gone the wrong way, and, uh, and I found a great hiding spot, you guys. I mean, it was a pitch black room so much so I had to kind of feel around in the room and 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 I finally I found this metal table and there was a space underneath and so I climbed under the table and I just waited and waited and waited and waited and and then I heard them calling for me it was Paul Jr. saying Dave Dave you, are you in here are you in here but not just Paul Jr. but Paul Sr. Dave are you in here and then I knew, I mean, it was time to come out. And so I said, yeah, I'm in here. And I start to crawl out from under that metal table. And they flip the lights on. And I, 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 I figured out that Paul Sr. was a funeral home director and that the metal table had a body on top of that thing. I don't know when the last time you needed courage was but I will tell you every night that I went to sleep during my dreams in the next few weeks after that, I needed some courage. I'm super excited to look at the sixth book of the Bible. We're gonna look at a guy by the name of Joshua in this series called Courage Calling. Now, when we first meet Joshua, He's got all the courage. It's back in Numbers 13, and the background is that Moses had been leading the people of Israel out from slavery in Egypt, and they're moving into, or about to move into the promised land, and Moses sends 12 spies in to scout out the land of Canaan, the promised land. After 40 days, these 12 spies come back, and two of the spies come back with all kinds of courage. It's Joshua and Caleb, and they say, absolutely, we've seen the people, we know our God, he can do amazing things, we can take the land. Joshua and Caleb, full of courage. That's why we remember their names. That's why we name our sons Joshua and Caleb. In fact, if you're in the room or you're at one of our campuses and you know someone named Joshua and Caleb, even thousands of years later, would you just raise your hand real quick if you know somebody named Joshua or Caleb, right? Right? Because they were the spies with courage. Now, probably nobody in the room knows somebody named Shemua or Shaphat because they were part of the 10 spies that didn't have courage, so we don't name our kids after them. That and the fact that if your kid's name is Shaphat, middle school's gonna be pretty tough for them, okay? <laughs> I'm just saying Shamua is probably going to the prom by himself, all right? So we don't name our kids that. It was Joshua and Caleb because they had courage. Let's read the Bible together. I'm in Joshua chapter 1, verse 1. It says this, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to a Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. And so the first thing I notice is that God is not so great at eulogies, okay? 
Like Moses does all this and this is all we see. God, my, Moses, my servant, is dead. No, that's not all there is. In fact, if you go back to Deuteronomy 34, you'll see that Moses had a 30-day funeral. A 30-day celebration of his life. 30 days where people were telling stories about Moses and remember when and kind of, you know, just just mourning his loss because he was such a great leader. 30 days. And I, I just think it's very interesting that God begins Joshua's call into leadership with a mention of this huge, epic celebration of life, this funeral that they'd all just experienced together. It's almost as if God is saying, hey, as you enter into this big call, when you're on the the beginning side of this, keep the end in mind. I think it was a Stephen Covey technique that had you go through an exercise where it said, you know, where he said, you know what? I want you to imagine your funeral and what you would hope people would say at your funeral. We don't like to think about that. We don't like to think about our, our, our funeral, but here's the deal. The mortality rate in the U.S. is hovering right around 100%, okay? Like we're all going to die. At some point, they're going to put you in the ground. They're going to go back to church. They're all going to eat potato salad, and they're going to talk about you. That's not the question. The question is, what will they say? I'm here to tell you that you can decide what they'll say. You can know what they'll say because what they're going to say is the sum of what you do from this day to that day. That's how they can remember you, is from this day to that day. So what do you want them to say about you, your friends, your family? Who are you going to be? What are the decisions you're going to make? What are the relationships you're going to nurture? What kind of life are you going to lead? What kind of call did you answer from the Lord God Almighty on your life? What do you want them to say about you? Man, he really loved Jesus. There was just something about him and his love for Jesus. She really followed God and it, it always saw the best in people. Man, that guy, he just had, he was, he was full of integrity. He, he, he said one thing and he stuck to it. You know what? Her family adored her. Just, you could just tell the love they have for her. She, she was brave. She would step into things that other people would shrink from. You know, he, he was so generous. He, he was just always had an open hand with things or with words. Or she was so encouraging. Or he was so fun. Like, what do you want people to say about you? It's important as we begin to enter into God's call on our life to have the end in mind. What do we want people to say about us. Well, that's verse one. Verse two, now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about to give to them, to the Israelites. Joshua one, one through two. God is starting with Joshua and he's saying, hey, God, uh, Joshua, I'm calling you into something real big. This is a real big deal, Joshua. And I just wonder if thousands of years later, as we listen to the same words that God had for Joshua, I wonder if those same words might be God's words for you and me and us as well. I wonder if God would look at us and say, you know what, I've got something big for you as well. I am calling you to something significant in your life. We just saw the story of a businessman who said, you know what, I could take my business and I could save the kingdom of God $40 million with my business. It just took somebody that said, you know what, I'm going to step out in faith into the calling that God has on my life. There are people that are listening to my voice right now that God is saying, you know that book that is way down deep in your heart that you just feel like if you could just birth that book and write that book, I think this might be the day that God says, yes, now's the time. That nonprofit that you think, man, I feel like we could get something started that would really meet a significant need in our community. This might be the day that God says, yes, now, do it. Now's the time. It could be 
Could be that for you, God is calling you to take a stand at work or to finally face an addiction or to lead a small group, huge significance there, or to coach a little league team in your community or to make a move in your career that's gonna have ripple effects for years to come. See, I think the things that God calls us into, sometimes they seem big, sometimes they seem small, but they are always significant when God is calling. Verse three, I will give you every place where you set your foot as I promised Moses. God is saying, yes, and when you follow me in my call, I will be with you and I will make this thing work. I'm, I'm gonna make this thing work. I have already called it the promised land. It is in the past tense. It is done. It is a foregone conclusion. And if God is calling you to follow him, he will enable you to follow him as well. Verse four, your territory will extend from the desert of Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. He's calling Joshua to take two million people and conquer 300,000 square miles. And at that point is when I imagine that Joshua's uh, uh, jaw just dropped and hit the floor. You, how big's the land? Where are we going? God, because here's the deal. There, there's a problem with the land of Canaan. There's Canaanites in there. And, we're gonna, and there's Jebusites in there. And there's Hittites in there. And there's Amorites in there. And there's Bud Lights in there. And there's all kinds of people in there. That, okay, you're paying attention. There's all kinds of people in there that we're going to have to conquer to do this. And God, I'm not a conqueror. I'm a wanderer. I've just spent the last 40 years of my life wandering. I've been putting up tents, taking down tents, putting up tents, taking down tents. I'm like a professional RVer, God. I am not a conqueror. I've spied once and I've been in one battle. And now you tell me that I'm basically going to need to conquer for years to come. And, and his jaw just hits the floor. But God had given him a clear call. That's the first takeaway I'd share with you is this, is that courage grows from having a clear call from God. A clear call from God. It's not necessarily that your courage grows because you feel qualified to do it. I mean, it's not that God looked at Joshua and said, I want you to do that because you're the best warrior we have. That's not necessarily it. Joshua's courage is not based on his qualifications. In fact, many times, God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. David wasn't a giant killer when God called him. Noah wasn't a shipbuilder when God called him. Peter wasn't an incredible leader, an orator when God called him. Paul wasn't a church planter when God called him. He wasn't a writer when God called him. God will call you and then he will qualify you. He will shape you. What did Jesus say? He said, come and follow me and then I will make you a fisher of men. God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the call, the question is not are you qualified, the question is what is God calling you to do? What is it that God is calling you to do in your life? Let me give you four questions that I've found useful for discerning what is it that God is calling me to do in life? What is it that is God's will for my life? The four questions, one, is it biblical? Is it biblical? Because God never contradicts himself. And so if you are interviewing at a new company, Dewey, Cheatham, and Howell, and find out that they really have a business plan where they undercut people and they fix the books and they do this kind of stuff, but you can make a lot of money compromising your integrity, well, then you can just go back and say, you know what, that's not God's will for my life because God would not call me to do something that contradicts the scriptures, even though I can make all kinds of money. Does that make sense? Let me give you a second question. Is it wise 
is it wise? I love how Wayne Cordero talks about this. He says, foolish people, they run into the wall. They hurt their nose, they hurt their face, they back up, and then they go do it again. And as silly as that sounds, we all know people who are foolish, who keep going back to the same mistakes, the same problems, the same thing again and again. That's what foolish people do. Smart people are able to learn from their mistakes. Smart people run into the wall and go, wow, that hurt. I'm not going to do that again. That's what smart people do. But wise people, they're able to learn from other people's mistakes. They're able to watch somebody else run into the wall and go, you know what? I don't think I'm going to do that. And so what is the wise thing for you to do? Look at what other people are doing. I don't, you know, should you go all in on crypto? I don't know. Maybe God's calling you to do that. I just don't know if it's the wisest thing to do. Should you quit your, your job and go tour with the band? I don't know. Maybe. I mean, God calls some people to do that, but is it the wise thing to do? Ask yourself that. Watch how God has worked in other people's lives and ask yourself, is the wise thing to do? Number three, does it match my own wiring, my own design, my own shape? I love how Rick Warren talks about this. He's got an acronym called SHAPE. In other words, how did God shape you when he formed you? The acronym is S, spiritual gifts. What are your spiritual gifts? H, your heart, your passion. What are you passionate about? A, your abilities. What are you good at? P, your personality. Are you an extrovert, introvert? Do you like working with people? Do you like working uh, alone on a computer? What, what, what's your personality? And then your experiences, the E. What has God built into your life that would give a clue to what he's calling you to in the future? What are your experiences? Does it match my shape? Is it biblical? Is it wise? And then the last one, what's my personal board of directors think about? I think everybody ought to have a personal board of directors that as you step out into what you think may be your call, the thing that God is calling you to do, as you experiment, as you, you take steps forward, then you go back to the people that you trust in your life and you say, am I good at that? Does this seem like a good thing for me to do? Pray about this with me. Well, walk in this with me, and we begin to discern what is it that God is calling us to do. Courage comes from having a clear call on your life. Number two, courage grows in the presence of God. I was 12 years old, went on a youth trip. Uh, we were gonna go whitewater rafting. We got to West Virginia, you could go on the New River, you could go on the Gully River. The New River had the rapids where you know, it was like the twos and the threes, and the gully had the fours and the fives. And I was like, let's go on. And somebody went, let's go to the fours and the fives. Mm. Oh, and by the way, the guide said, we'd, have a really, we'd had a really wet season, rainy season. And so uh, a lot of the rapids that were rated fours are actually fives now. And I got in the boat, and we put off. And I'd never done this before. And was I scared? No, not at all. Why? Because my dad was in the back of the boat. My dad, who I thought was superhero, Superman. And when my dad's with me, then I'm not afraid. Look at what our heavenly father tells Joshua in verse 5. He says, no one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. What kind of confidence do you have walking into God's will for your life, God's calling on your life, knowing that God's promise is to walk right next to you, to walk with you in that? And I love what he does. He says, you know what? Look in the rear view mirror of your life and see how I walked with Moses. You want confidence? Think about those Red Sea moments. Think about the 10 plagues moments. Think about water from a rock. You think about the, the pillar of fire, the pillar of cloud. You think about manna from heaven. You think about all those things and know that as you move forward, I'm still that God. And I'm gonna walk with you just like I walked with Moses. You know, I don't like getting older except for this. My faith keeps growing. As I get older, I've got more in the rear view mirror. And as I look in that rear view mirror, I see more and more times where God showed up in my life and he was faithful. More time, I'll give you just one. I'm, 
coming up on my uh, anniversary next month. You know, when, when Rachel and I were dating, we were in college. We met at Wheaton College, local here. And then I lived in Cincinnati, and she lived in Lake Geneva. And in the summer, we went, we went back to our homes, and I was starting to realize as I'm praying through this relationship that the next level of the relationship, the next logical step in this relationship involved things like vulnerability and commitment and intimacy and things that I was really scared about. And so one day it kind of all came to a head and I'm in my bedroom in the middle of Cincinnati and I'm just praying, God, if you want me to to move forward, to marry this woman, then you are going to have to send me a sign. And right at that moment, my bedroom door started knocking like this. And I opened the door, and there was Rachel, right there. She'd flown in from, she worked it out with my parents, she'd flown in to, to surprise me. And I'm no dummy. I was like, I think I'm supposed to marry this girl, you know? And here we are. This is our, our picture. That's 25 years in. Look at that. Oh, oh, she is a lucky woman, I tell you what. <laughs> the clear calling, the presence of God in your life. And number three, can I just say this? Courage requires grit. I don't think grit is anywhere um, spelled out in the Bible, but I think it's all over the Bible. People that had grit, grit is being unstoppable. Grit is perseverance. Grit is resolve. God doesn't coddle Joshua. Seven times between Deuteronomy and in this chapter, either Moses or God is saying, don't be afraid, be strong and courageous. You be strong and courageous. And Joshua knew what he was about to face, and God knew what he was about to face. Joshua wasn't about to face microaggressions. He was about to face macro aggression, people that were about to to take his head off. He wasn't going to have the the, the trigger from this or that. People were trying to swing for his face. And God says, you be strong, and you be courageous, and you lean in. And he's got to say it seven times. (laughs) Verse 6, he says, be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. In other words, he brings in this, this, this concept that you are not alone in this. You're not alone in this. And I would say that to you all as well. I love, I love uh, Fatai was here leading worship, and, and she called it Willow Family. I love that. Oh, that we could be much more than just some big church, but that we could be family for each other, that I could support you and you could support me and And then I would realize that I'm not in this alone, that what God is calling me to, first of all, when I get the sense that I could never accomplish what God is calling me to on my own, and God says, you're absolutely right, you can't. And as soon as you think you can, then your vision is way too small. If it's really God's calling on your life, you will not be able to accomplish it alone. And so we need each other family. We need each other. And let me encourage you. We're not alone. Let's do a little mass confession. Should we do that real quick? Just so we know, because some people are sitting here. Some people may be watching for the first time and going, I'm the only one that feels this way. Listen, if you have ever been afraid that you were not enough, afraid that it won't add up, afraid that you won't be able to accomplish it, afraid that you won't have what it takes, that you won't finish strong, that you won't be liked that you won't be smart enough, you're afraid of rejection, afraid of what somebody else will think, if you've ever been afraid of what they'll do to you or afraid you might fail, would you just raise your hand at all of our campuses and look around the room and realize you're not alone. Some of us are scared to death walking with God, and yet we're so alive, trusting him. Well, Joshua's feeling this fear. He, he had, God had to tell him seven times. Why? Because he wasn't strong and courageous. He was weak and afraid. God knew that. And, and then God began to turn the corner and tell him how he's going to do it. 
Well, how am I supposed to be? Do I just wake up one day and look in the mirror and go, be strong? How do you do it? Well, God tells him, verse seven, be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not, don't you turn from the right or to the left. You just write that you may be successful wherever you go. Verse eight, you keep this book of the law always on your lips. You meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it and then you'll be prosperous and successful. The fourth point is this, the fourth takeaway is courage grows through Bible engagement. I just really believe that. I know that sounds old school, but I just really believe that the more we get our nose in the book, the more courage, the more success we'll have in following God's calling on our life. Now, three things that were said in that little verse, in verse eight, one is you gotta keep the book always on your lips. In other words, we ought to be discussing it all the time. You ought to be in a small group, a coaching group. You ought to be in some sort of mentor relationship. You ought to be in some, maybe your family, whatever it is. I don't care, maybe your family just goes out to eat after church and you just discuss the word of God together. What do you think about what was said today? Maybe you as a family, you, you get Right Now Media. We offer that to everybody in our church. It's basically Netflix for Jesus. You open up little studies, little videos. It's age appropriate. And you just say, hey, what do you think about that? We ought to be discussing the word of God. We ought to be singing the word of God. It ought to be always on our lips. That's why I love coming out here and singing these truths because there's something about when she starts singing and he starts singing and then you all start singing that I start believing it not just here but here. Anybody else have that experience? Where you go, you know, I'll read this and I'll get it here but now I walk away and I'm like ready to take on a giant because I feel it in here. It is well with my soul. <laughs> it is well with my soul. We ought to discuss it. We ought to sing it. That's keeping the book always on your lips. And then it says meditate on it. You shall meditate on it day and night. For me, that's memorization. How do you memorize the scriptures? I don't know. Write down a scripture that you like. Put it on a three by five card. Put it up on the visor of your car. When you go to a stoplight, just put it down like that. Read it, read it, read it, read it. When you hear a horn, then you put it back up and then you drive, okay? <laughs> you will memorize all kinds of scripture with that little method. You might not make a lot of friends, but do it. Pray the scriptures. You ought to pray the scriptures back to God. God, you say in your word, in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Therefore, God, I'm confessing my sins to you and I'm gonna walk away with a clear conscience because you have forgiven me. You pray the scriptures back to God. And then the last thing I would share with you, it says, do all that is written in it. Obey it. Obey what you read. If y'all came over to my house and at the end of dinner, I got up and I said, you're not gonna believe this, but for dessert, I'm gonna read you the recipe for a cake. Aren't you excited? I'm gonna get up and I'm gonna read this. First, we're gonna have some eggs and then you put in this and that's what you do and then you bake it and, you bake, and then I'm gonna put it down and you guys are gonna be so excited about that. No, you're not. Well, what if I said, you know what? Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna memorize the recipe and I'm gonna recite it for you and I'm gonna recite it for you. You're gonna go, Dave, I am not excited about you memorizing this thing. I mean, that's just, there's, some, there's gotta be something more, Dave. What if I came to you and I said, we're gonna get in a circle and we're gonna study it together. We're gonna talk about what we think, whether it ought to be three eggs or two eggs, or oh, you know, my grandma used to put this in there or that in there. We're gonna study it together. And you'd say, no, 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 not even that. I said, okay, well, here's the deal. I wrote a song about the recipe. Cake baker, multiple layers, promise. You never stop, you never stop frosting, right? Like, and at some point you're like, Dave, just stop, we get it. Because all you care about is whether I baked that cake. Did I follow the instructions? Did I do it right? That's what you care about. And I think God sometimes is up in heaven and he's looking at you and he's looking at me and he's going, I love your singing, it's great. I love that you memorized that verse, good job. I love that you circle up in little groups and you read it, I love it. I mean, I wrote it because I wanted you to read it, 
But here's the ultimate. Would you please put it into action? I have a coaching group. We meet every day. Every day we get together and we, 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 uh, and, and we read a passage of Scripture. And then we literally, like the one thing that we're trying to take from it is this. What is the one thing in that Scripture that I am going to apply in my life today? Do you have a relationship like that? Do you have a group like that? Do you have a habit like that? I would encourage you to do that. Courage can grow when it's anchored in the word of God. Let's finish with this. Verse nine, have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous, do not be afraid, do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. In the 1950s, Dr. Richter from Harvard University did a study with rats. He took the rats and he put them in water and he watched them swim. He wanted to see how long they could swim before they began to sink. On average, the rat would swim, the, the rats would swim for 15 minutes and then they would sink. And some of you in your life, some of you are in your life, you're on like minute 14. You feel like you're on minute 15, like you're half, you're 30 seconds in a minute 15, and you're just like, I don't know if I can keep going. I don't know if I have what it takes. I don't know, and God's calling me to this, and I'm scared, and I, I don't have courage, and I don't know if I can move forward, and I feel like I'm the only one that feels this way, and I'm alone in it, and I, I don't have anybody to help me, and you're in, you're in minute 15. And can I tell you that what happened is that when the, the rats would begin to sink at minute 15, the doctor would reach in, and he would grab the rats, and he would rescue them, and he would put them out, and he would let them rest. And then, I don't know, it seems a little cruel, but I guess for science's sake, <laughs> he took the rats after they had a few minutes of rest and he put them back in the water. He wanted to study how long they would stay afloat. And do you know how long they swam the second time in the water? You say, well, I mean, I see where you're going with this. I, you got a point, so, I don't know, 16 minutes? 20 minutes, 30 minutes? No, on average, the rats lasted 60 hours. 60 hours, do you know why? Because they had hope. They'd had the experience. They believed that there was somebody greater than them that when they needed it, could rescue them and could save them. And as we study Joshua over the next couple of weeks, I want you to always keep this in the back of your mind that the Hebrew word or the Hebrew name Joshua is actually pronounced Yeshua and that Yeshua, a Latin transliteration of Yeshua is actually Jesus. And that as we study Joshua and what he did geographically leading people into the, the promised land. I want you to know that Jesus does spiritually leading us into the eternal promised land. Jesus Christ was a fully man. He was fully God. He came down from heaven and he lived a perfect sinless life. And then he chose to allow himself to die on a cross for your sins. And because he was both fully God and fully man, lived a sinless life, he has a right to extend an invitation to you and to me and to say that if you will come and put your faith in me and follow me, then you can overcome sin and death in your life just like you're about to see me do because on the third day, he kicked the back out of that tomb and it became a, well, no, he came out the front. But anyway, he made it a tunnel on up to heaven and I I am telling you, if you will accept the invitation to put your faith in Jesus Christ, your sins will be forgiven, and you can live with God forever. That's the gospel. That's the good news, and part of that good news is that he comes to live with you. He is there with you so that when God, when Jesus puts a call on your life, you can have the courage to follow that call. What is your next step with Jesus? Do you need to get in a group? Do you need to crap out, crack open the Bible? Do you need to develop a, a discipline, a habit of prayer? 
Do you need to go to a counselor for the first time? Do you need to find a pastor and say, I'm ready to give my life to Jesus. Help me make that decision. I want to encourage you, whatever your next step with God is, if you're not dead, God is not done with you. Whatever your next step is, let's take it together as a family at all of our campuses as we stand and sing this song together. Amen. Come on, why don't we lean in in this moment and just do a little more worship. Come on. See you move, you move the mountains, and I believe I see you do it again. Made a way where there was no way, and I believe I see. Come on, we sing it out. See you move. never imagined that God would have had a calling on my life. I mean, who am I? But he does. There's one for each of us, maybe several times he may call us into something. And I realized the last time that I was called to something that I was really afraid to say yes, but I couldn't imagine saying no. It was, it was such a tension to live in. And whatever he might be calling you to, you know, next step in your faith, a step in your faith, or something scary, you know, at work. So many examples that Pastor Dummett shared. You know, even just to lean in on a Sunday like today. You know, whatever God is calling us into, we may not be able to see the path or have confidence in it. We may not believe in our own abilities, but we can have confidence in God. He's promised to go before us. He's promised to be there with us in it. And so we're invited into that today. Let's pray. God, we thank you. We thank you that you do have these callings on our lives, God. These purposes that you have for us, God. We pray for your provision, your providence, your peace, clarity for what the next step is for each of us, God. We thank you. We thank you for what you do for us the strength that you give us, that you instill in us, the inspiration that you give us to do what comes next, to have that courage, God. And we can, because we can have confidence in you. We thank you, we love you, and we praise you. And all God's people said, amen. Well, I hope you guys planned a few extra minutes because today, party on the patio. Today was a great way to kick off summer and the party continues out there. Hope you guys have a great week. In the grace he bled 
From his blood-stained hands that still shape my life My God, most I gave his life to give me mine My God, most I Dead to love.